Hi, everybody. And here we go now with unit three in CHY 113. So just looking back a little bit over where we've been, we started out in module one, looking at, or sorry, unit one, in, by looking at some of the very basic concepts that we use in chemistry, some of the, the, the basics of what chemistry is, some of the tools that we use with, with counting and data and so forth. Uh, and then we started to get a little bit into chemical reactions in that unit. Unit two, we dove into looking at the amounts involved in chemical reactions and the energy involved in reactions. Now in unit three, we're going to go back and take even a deeper dive into, the, into looking at the structure of an atom. Because it turns out that most of what we, we talked about in unit two, and, and in fact, most of chemical behavior in general is actually governed by the behavior of electrons. And so we really need to look pretty deeply at the structure of electrons and how electrons are actually arranged around the nucleus in order to start to make sense of, of why things behave the way they do. For instance, when we looked at coming up with ionic formulas and we used the, the periodic table to predict the charge on a particular ion, for, you know, that magnesium is going to form a plus two, fluorine is going to form a minus one and so forth. What we're going to see is that, that that is governed, that is directed by the actual arrangement of electrons on the outside of the nucleus. And so we're going to really get very, very deep in this unit in, into just how electrons are arranged. From there, we're also going to move on to looking at the shapes of entire compounds and how that ends up also dictating a lot of the various properties of those compounds. And that will take up most all of unit three. And so, as I had said, we're, we're going to, it, it's actually the electrons that, or as I alluded to, when two atoms react with each other, it's actually the electrons that are doing that. It's the electrons that are doing something in some way in order to, to enable two atoms to come together to, to react with each other. Most of our understanding of electrons actually comes from looking at the nature of light. And so that's what we are really, one of the things that we really need to take a look at is the very nature of light itself. And that's where we begin this, this unit. When an atom gains energy, it becomes what we call excited. That added energy, that energy that the atom gained is actually absorbed by the electrons and then ends up being released in the form of what we call electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation is a big, fancy, scary sounding term. All it really means is essentially light energy. And, and we're going to see that light energy encompasses all sorts of, of different types of energy, not just the light that we see and, and that we interact with, uh, but really all types of energy from radio waves all the way up to something high energy like gamma rays. And so light, or, or like I said, radio waves, x-rays, things like that, all travels as a wave. And not only that, they travel at the same rate. And so a radio wave travels at the same exact speed that an X-ray does. We're going to see that there are many other properties that are different, but the actual speed at which those things travel, those waves travel is the exact same. And that's equal to the speed of light, which is a universal constant. And we'll, we'll work with that number here in a little bit. Some of the different properties of waves we have to be aware of though. And so if this is sort of a, a depiction of, of a typical wave, the intensity of light in the intensity of a wave is a function of the amplitude, which is this aspect of the wave right here. And so if you're thinking of sort of comparing this to waves on a beach, for instance, this would be how high up the waves are versus the wave length is another feature of a wave. The wave length is what is the distance that it takes for the particle or for the wave to go through one complete wave. And so this would be one complete wave right here. And so that distance is the wave length of the wave. So when light is typically characterized by both its wavelength and its frequency, the frequency of a wave is equal to how many full waves does it go through every second? And we'll look at the units for that in just a little bit, but that's what the frequency is, is how many 
of these waves the whole particle goes through or the wave itself goes through per second. That's hertz or cycles per second. Let's take a look at how those are actually related to each other with this little demonstration here. And so with this demonstration, let's see if I can get this set up right. I want the fixed end there. I'm gonna go ahead and just get the wave started. So here we have a wave. I'll actually turn up the amplitude a little bit just so we can see it a little easier. Now let's, let's take a look at the relationship between the frequency and the wavelength. Maybe if I turn on the ruler, does that help us see it a little bit? A little bit maybe. So we can see that the wavelength of this wave Oh, and it's a little hard to see here, but the wavelength of this wave is roughly, what would we say, maybe three centimeters or so. Let's take a look at what happens though, if I really drop the frequency. So the frequency of this wave has now decreased and we can see pretty clearly that the wavelength though has increased. It's a longer wave now longer wave, lower frequency. If I increase the frequency though, now what happens to our wavelength? Our wavelength decreases. And so we can see pretty quickly, just looking at this little demonstration, that the frequency and wavelength are absolutely inversely proportional to each other. For any type of wave, and this, is, this holds true for any wave behavior, wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. If your wavelength increases, your frequency decreases and vice versa. And in fact, those are related through this equation here. C, the speed of light, equals the frequency times the wavelength. And we can see that right here. So this, as a side note, I, I use V a lot in the, or the letter V, but this actually is, should be the Greek symbol mu. And so just be aware of that, that it's not actually V, but V is a lot easier to type when, when putting together presentations like this. And so you'll see that quite often. I'm just bringing up my whiteboard real quick so we can take a peek at that. There's two of me, you don't need that. There we go. And so like I said, that's, that's, that's actually the, the Greek symbol mu, which looks something like that. And so C is equal to wavelength times, times mu or lambda times nu for the frequency. And so the speed of light, C, is always, always, always this three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Like I said earlier, that's a universal constant that will never, ever, ever change. Speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Wavelength, the Greek symbol lambda, when you're doing these calculations, and we're going to look at some of these calculations in a little bit, your wavelength must always be in meters. Now that's going to be real important for us to keep in mind because quite often your wavelength won't actually be reported in meters. Your wavelength might be reported in nanometers will, will be a very common one or some other length unit. And you would absolutely have to convert that to meters before doing any calculations. Frequency, it said the, is the Greek letter nu. Seconds minus one, so one over seconds or hertz. Remember, that's the cycles per second. That's how many full waves we go through per second. Typically, we're going to see hertz as our unit for frequency. And this just goes over some of that. So our units of C, 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, our frequency, and our wavelength and distance. And so when we're looking at these relationships or when we're thinking about light in general and electromagnetic radiation in general, we typically will actually refer to the, the wavelength as, as identifying the type of wave that we're talking about. 
And so we can see wavelengths down here on the bottom of the scale. And so any time, so if we have waves that are about a meter or so or larger, those are radio waves. And so we can see sort of that range here between about a meter to maybe 10 meters or so. That's gonna be where FM radio waves are. AM radio waves. Starting to get a little bit longer and then long radio waves. And so things that are used for instance, like, uh, like ham radio operators would be, would be using wavelengths up in this range. Incidentally, not that anyone ever listens to the radio anymore, but AM and FM, frequency modulation versus amplitude modulation. And so if you do listen to the radio, what you're literally doing is tuning the dial to a station that simply uses a different frequency than another one. And so that different frequency is just a different frequency energy wave that they're sending out. Versus AM, now we're working with different amplitudes of the wave. And so it's just the different, um, different types of stations, either AM or FM, are simply using different features of a wave and manipulating those different features in order to differentiate the different stations. But now as we start to get a little bit smaller, we start to get to the 10 to the minus two meter range or so, so like the centimeter range, those are microwaves. This is the type of energy that your microwave oven uses. Now it's a very common misconception or misuse of the word. People quite often throw food in a microwave and they say, oh, we're just gonna nuke it. But th that energy is very, very, very different. The actual energy of microwaves is not that high. Another relationship that we'll see in a little bit, but as our, as our wavelength gets smaller, the energy actually increases. So the energy of visible light, the energy of the light that we see and interact with is actually a higher energy than microwaves. The reason that microwaves actually work to heat up your food, however, is because of, of a, another feature of waves that we won't talk about in here, but if you study physics, you'll learn a lot about resonance. Resonance is when something will literally vibrate if you hit it with the right frequency. And that's what's happening with microwaves is that microwaves are at the same, are at the resonance frequency of water. And so a microwave literally makes water molecules start to speed up and start to vibrate a lot more. And as we talked about a little bit in the last unit, and we'll talk about more when we get to gas laws and talking more about temperature, that speed, that motion of molecules is what we perceive as temperature. And so as the water molecules in food or whatever you have in the microwave, as those water molecules start to speed up due to the, the resonance frequency, that increases the temperature. And so that's what's actually heating up your food is, is that increased motion of water molecules in there. A little tidbit for you. Uh, and another just incidental, the mesh that you see on the front of a microwave door, that mesh is actually a physical barrier. The microwaves are literally too large to get through those holes because those microwaves are waves that are right around a centimeter or so in that range. And they, they literally can't fit and they can't pass through that barrier. It's literally a physical barrier stopping them from coming out. But then as we move up a little bit, or we move lower in, in wavelengths, smaller and smaller wavelengths, so we get to the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then even smaller, now we get to the visible spectrum. So now we start, it starts to become useful for us to think in terms of nanometers, just because we're getting to such a small wavelength. And so in between roughly 380 to about 720 or so, somewhere in that range, that's the actual range of visible light that we see and interact with. And so quite literally, when you're observing different colors, what that really is, is just a, a different wavelength of light. If you have a wave that has, that's roughly 500 nanometer wavelength, we see that as pretty much green or like a bluish green somewhere in this range versus light that's maybe, what's this, like 570 or so, 570 nanometer wave, our eyes perceive that as yellow. 
400 meter wavelength, 400 nanometer wavelength, we, we perceive that as blue. And so then we start to get even smaller. We get to the UV spectrum, so ultraviolet. Smaller and smaller and smaller. Now we get to X-rays. And then even smaller than that, we start to get up into gamma rays. And so very, very, very small wavelengths, 10 to the negative 16th meters or so, good God. And so we get to very, very small, but we also see the, look what happens to our frequency. And so we're decreasing in wavelength as we move right to, sorry, as we move right to left, but our frequency increases because those are inversely proportional to each other. Let's look at some calculations that we might be able to do. And so using our equation, and this is the light equation that we'll work with a fair bit. So speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. We're going to use this quite often in this unit in order to calculate either the wavelength or the frequency of a wave as long as we're given the other one. And so in this question here, and so I was born, just to, to date myself a little bit here, I was born in 1976. And so my parents are, were slightly hippie-ish and I listened to a lot of WBLM growing up. Classic rock, that's what my parents listened to. That's what I grew up listening to. And so WBLM, their, their station or their, their frequency is 102.9 megahertz. So from that, we can calculate the actual wavelength of the wave that they use. And so we're going to use our light equation, C equals wavelength times frequency. We want to solve this for wavelength. And so our wavelength is going to equal C over frequency. Now our frequency, 102.9 megahertz, we do need to convert that over to Hertz before we can use this in our equation. And so there are 10 to the six Hertz per, oops, per megahertz. And so 102.9 times 10 to the sixth. Wow, calculator issues today, here we go. Oh, I should have been able to do that. Anyway, we get 1.029 times 10 to the eighth. And so that's going to go in for our frequency. C is given at 3.00 times 10 to the eighth. So that's over one. 0 0.029 times 10 to the eighth. And we get a wavelength of 2.92 meters. We can go the other way. And so typically even still when, when I'm in my car, I've got an old 06 Corolla. And so I don't really, I don't play, it doesn't hook into Bluetooth or anything like that. I'm pretty much down to just using the radio when I drive anywhere. I still either listen to WBLM or NPR quite often. So we can do the same thing. We can go the other direction with our calculation though. And here, so we know that NPR uses a wavelength to broadcast their, their station of 3.32 meters. We want to know what frequency that is in megahertz. I want to know what to dial my, my nice 06 Corolla radio to. And so we're going to use our same basic light equation. But now we need to solve for frequency. So that's going to equal C over lambda. So we're going to have 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second divided by our 3.32 meters. So 9.03 times 10 to the seventh hertz. 
our, our units for frequency. Now we need to convert that to megahertz. So we get 9.03 times 10 to the seventh hertz. Ten to the sixth hertz per one megahertz. So I'm going to dial to ninety point four megahertz in order to hear some of my in order to hear things like what's happening on NPR. And so this is going to be a very very common type of calculation for us. Let me come back. We are going to use this relationship a lot for our calculations in this unit. And so you're, that's like def, this is definitely a calculation that you're going to want to know how to do. Another relationship is that of the energy. The energy of a wave is proportional to its frequency. And it will be equal to H, which is Planck's constant, times our frequency. So the energy in joules. It's going to be equal to Planck's constant times frequency. Planck's constant is this number here, 6.6262. 6.63 is probably close enough. Um, but 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th joules per second. And that would tell you the energy of one particle of wave. We'll talk about this, this idea of waves being particles um, in just a little bit as well. We could equate the two of these together. And so if you know the frequency, then you can simply plug in to the energy equation and find the energy. If you're given the wavelength, you can go a couple different ways with that. You can either first just simply use our wavelength equation, solve for frequency, and then plug it in here. We could also plug in this rewritten version for frequency into our energy equation. And we could get energy equals HC over lambda. Same thing either way. And, and so you can either solve for the frequency first using the wavelength and then plug it in, or use the rewritten equation and just calculate it directly. But that's how we would calculate the energy of a certain wave. And so now we're going to take a look at something that we call spectra. And, and so if a gas is excited, if we take a sample of gas, think neon, for instance, take some neon gas and we zap it with electricity, that will excite the gas. At this point now, the electrons have more energy than they had. And so the electrons go from a higher energy, they, they end up, and, and we'll see what this looks like in a little bit, but the electrons get excited and go to a higher energy state and then they come back down to their lower energy state. When they come back down to that lower energy state, light is emitted. And that's what we see as color in those situations. So if you're looking at a neon light that, that's plugged in and turned on and you see the color in that, that's literally what you're observing is the electrons in that gas going up into an excited state. And then when they drop back down to their normal state, they release that light. And that's what we observe. When we look at the light that is, is actually emitted from that, it turns out that excited atoms only emit lights of a certain wavelength. And so for instance, for hydrogen, you can't really see it on, on this screen that well, but if we take some hydrogen gas, so here's, here's like a tube that has hydrogen gas in it, and we take that hydrogen gas and we project it through a prism so normally, if we send light through a prism, if we put, for instance, well, the colors of a rainbow or why a rainbow appears is because visible light, the light from the sun, goes through the water molecules, goes through the water droplets, and the water acts as a prism and separates out the sunlight into all the colors of the rainbow. We do the same thing here with excited gases, and we don't see all the colors of the rainbow. We only see certain colors of light. In the case of hydrogen, there are two purple lines, which you can't really see, but there's one purple line here and one purple line here. There's sort of a blue-green line, and there's sort of a reddish line. And every element emits different wavelengths of light. Helium 
emits, and again, you can't really see probably from, from in your screens, but helium emits a wavelength here, 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 and here. Iron, if we do the same thing to iron gas, it'll limit all these different wavelengths. And so Niels Bohr was a scientist who did a lot of this work, who, who was really looking at some of these different spectra and the fact that only certain wavelengths of light are actually seen. And he did a bunch of these different ones. He was able to, 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 to see, again, the, this idea that each element only emits certain wavelengths of light or certain colors. Now, there was a lot of other work that was going on at this time. And your, your book talks about some, some other work, some other things such as the photoelectric effect and black body radiation. And I'm not necessarily going to go into, into detail on those. Definitely look through those in your book and read through those and try to understand what those are. But all of those ideas, all of those things ended up playing into Bohr's thought process. What Bohr kind of finally figured out is the fact that we see those different lines, that we see only particular lines emitted from excited gases was due to the fact that electrons are not simply scattered haphazardly everywhere they, they, they can be outside the nucleus. They're actually confined to specific energies called orbits. And that's what we see here is different orbits that an electron can be on. So here's our nucleus here in the middle and these other rings are orbits where we might find electrons. And what he figured out is that the different lines that we actually see correspond to different sort of jumps that an electron can do. And so if an electron maybe is here in the first shell and, and has enough energy to jump out here, then when it falls back down, so remember we talked about that, that when an electron loses that energy and comes back down, it emits light. That's now emitting a certain color wavelength. Or if an electron, maybe he's here on the first shell and jumps out to the second and then comes back down, that's emitting a certain color wavelength. And so that was really Bohr's big, big conclusion and big determination was that these lines that we see are due to the fact that electrons are only found on certain energy levels. And that was pretty big. Uh, again, there was a lot of other work going on at the time that led to this. And so Bohr was drawing on, on the work of lots of different people, lots of different scientists to come to this conclusion. It's not a perfect analogy. And in, in a lot of ways, I, I hesitate to use this, but it's a good way to visualize it that really kind of one of the things that Bohr found was that, that electrons are kind of arranged like the solar system. Picture the sun as being like the nucleus of an atom and you find planets only in very specific orbits. You're never gonna find a planet that's somewhere in between the orbit of Earth and Mars. There's just not a planet there. Similarly, you would never find an electron in between these two different orbits. You're either gonna find an electron here on this first one or here on the second one, here on this third one and so forth. And so the line spectra, the, the spectra that, that Bohr is seeing is coming from this fact, is coming from the fact that the, an electron might jump, for instance, from what we call its ground state and gain energy to come up to a different state and then drop back down. And we can calculate that associated energy, which we'll be looking at in just a minute. But we have to define just a couple of terms. One of those is the ground state, and that's just the lowest energy level. And so what we would call n equals one, and we're gonna define that n here in a little bit, uh, but that would just be in the case of a hydrogen atom, that would just correspond to our first, the, the, um, just the first energy shell that an electron could be found on. An excited state, is now the electron's been given energy to jump up to another orbit. And then we're not gonna worry about energy equals zero for an electron that's completely just busted free. We have something that we call the Balmer equation. 
which allows us to actually calculate the, the wavelengths associated with the different colors that we see. And so again, if we sort of visualize what's happening here, we have this ground state. So an electron just sitting here at, at the, the first orbit that it can be found on, it absorbs energy. So it's gonna absorb in this case about 984 kilojoules of energy, gives it enough energy to jump up to the next energy level. As it then drops back down, it's going to emit that amount of energy. It's going to emit that 984 kilojoules. And so here's the key though. And, and this, is, um, this is some of the calculation and work that allowed Bohr to, to figure this out. When this energy is emitted, and so again, let's just think about what's happening. The, the electron gains energy jumps up to a, another level, and then it almost immediately releases that energy again. And so the electron is now releasing a certain amount of energy. We said that energy is, is, is equi or, or the energy of, of an electron in these cases is equal to Planck's constant times frequency. And so energy is proportional to frequency And frequency is related to wavelength. And so really each energy, and we looked at combining these equations where energy can be equal to HC over wavelength, which ultimately means we could solve this for wavelength, that wavelength is going to equal HC over energy. And so if we know the amount of energy that's actually being given off, that is going to correspond to a specific wavelength, which corresponds to one of those particular colors that we saw in the spectrum. Now we can do calculations with this called the, the Balmer equation or, or Balmer series in which we can actually calculate the wavelength Uh, let's see, how do I want to, some of this that I don't really want to go into and talk about, but there we go, this will work. And so what we can do is we can actually calculate the wavelength given off using all this information, putting all this together. We can calculate the wavelength that is given off with certain jumps between these electron orbitals. And that's what this Balmer equation allows us to do. So one over the wavelength equals, don't worry about this V, this is a wave number thing. It's not something that we're gonna work with, but one over the wavelength equals the Rydberg constant times, in this case, the Balmer series is just for jumps from the second energy level. So let's, let's just come to here real quick, then we'll come back. Okay, sorry about that. I just wanted, I had to pause the video and, and collect my thoughts for a minute because I knew that I wasn't really discussing this. Um, I wasn't really talking about this this clearly. And so let's just, let's back up for just a second. And so here's our nucleus. And so what we've talked about is that Bohr figured out that the electrons exist on very specific shells around the nucleus. What we can do is we can actually calculate the wavelength that's associated. So again, let's say we have an electron right here on our first shell, gets hit with a little bit of energy, causes it to jump up here to the second shell. Almost immediately though, it's going to fall back down. And that can happen in between any of the shells. We could, we could start here, jump up to the third, and then fall back down to the first and so on. We, we could even go from, so we, we've got other energy levels out here too. Forgive the very crude to scale drawing, but we could go for instance from, we could be here on the second, jump out to the fifth and back down. And so we could be making any of these jumps in between the shells of, of electrons. What this equation here allows us to do is to predict, so in each case here, we're going to emit light 
when the electron drops back down. All light has an associated wavelength with it. And so this Balmer equation, or the Rydberg equation rather, allows us to calculate the actual wavelength of light that will be emitted for each of these jumps. And this equation is one over the wavelength equals the Rydberg constant times one over where the electron ends up. It says N sub F, what, what shell does the electron land on minus what shell did it start from? And so for instance, if we're starting, if, we, if we're talking about maybe this jump right here, then we would be falling from the third energy level. And so we'd have our Rydberg constant times one over three. Oh, and sorry, big piece that I forgot. These are all squared. That's a big part of this equation. And so if we're talking about that energy jump, one over three squared minus, it ends up on the first energy level, one over one squared, and then multiplied by the Rydberg constant. And then that gets us to one over the wavelength. I know this is some complicated stuff. Once you start working with these, these calculations a little bit, it'll make more sense. So that gets us, gets us to one over the wavelength. So we take the inverse and that predicts our wavelength. And so that's all a real lengthy way to, to say that what we can do is we can use that equation. We can use this Rydberg equation to predict the actual colors that we see for hydrogen. And the colors that we see for hydrogen all involve drops back down to the second energy level. And so an electron that was on the second energy level gets enough energy to jump to the sixth. When it drops back down from six to two, the Rydberg equation tells us that's going to emit a wavelength at 410.2 nanometers. That's one of our purple lines. From five down to two, it's another purple line. From four down to two, that's our green line. From three down to two, that's our red line. And so that's a way for us to predict the wavelength that we're going to see when, when electrons drop back down to certain energy levels. Now this, this relationship and this model worked out very well and, and gave us a great way to describe the line spectra of the hydrogen atom. It turns out though that this only worked for one electron systems. And so hydrogen being a one electron system, if we have helium plus, if we, if we remove one electron from helium, that would be a one electron system and this system worked out well for it. And Bohr won the, ninth, the, the, the Nobel in 1929 for this work. It was, it was groundbreaking work. But it only worked for these simple one electron systems. And so this led to a, to a whole other branch of science called quantum mechanics. And it led, and there was some other thinking going on at the time as well. And we haven't really talked about this much, but we, light can be thought of as both a particle and a wave and as particles of each. We've talked about a lot of these, the wave type properties it turns out that light has properties of a particle as well. We can think of particles of light, which are called photons. And so a lot of people at this time were thinking, well, if light can be viewed in terms of both waves and particles, can other, can other, can other things be treated the same way? Can other things be thought of as waves and particles? Can things like electrons? And so it turns out that ma all matter has properties of a wave. And we can use the, what we call the de Broglie equation to find the actual wavelength of all matter. And so even something like, and I don't have a little ball down here. I should have grabbed one of my son's little toy balls. Um, but if we throw a ball through the air, think of a pitch. Somebody, somebody throws a pitch, baseball or softball pitch, heading from the pitcher to the catcher. It looks like it's moving just in a straight line. It turns out that it's not though. It's actually moving in a wave. And we can use the de Broglie equation to calculate the actual wavelength of that wave. 
where the wavelength is going to equal h. There's Planck's constant again over the mass. This is one of the only times that you would use mass in kilograms times the velocity in meters per second. And so when we plug that information in, it turns out that that wavelength is way, 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 way too small for, for large things. And so yes, the wavelength of, of, a, of a fastball, the fastball is actually moving in a wave, but that wavelength is way too small for us to have to worry about, like 10 to the negative 34th meters small. But for really, really, really small things like electrons, that wavelength actually matters. And so what this meant for us is that when we're thinking in terms of electrons, we have to consider the wave type behavior of it. And so, so here's an example. If we calculate the actual wavelength of a golf ball, it's one times 10 to the negative 34th meters. And so that, that wave behavior isn't going to influence the, the movement or the behavior of the golf ball. And that's just the, the numbers and the calculation that I used. For an electron, now we have a wavelength that's a lot bigger, especially in, in, in relative terms to the size of the actual electron. And so what that means is that we have to take into account this wave behavior. And I know we're sort of jumping all over the place here a little bit, but that's, that's kind of the, the nature of this topic. And so that led us to looking at wave or quantum mechanics. And so ultimately what this really meant for us is that, that it gave us this brand new way to think of matter in thinking uh, of matter as having wave type behavior and probabilities. And we, you might have heard of Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger's cat plays into this. I'm not going to go into it here, but definitely look up Schrodinger's cat if you've never heard of that. And then we have the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Yes, that Heisenberg, for those of you familiar with Breaking Bad, this is where he got the name. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle stated that it's impossible for us to, to know both the, the position and direction of an electron and that knowing one can affect the other and so forth. I'm actually not going to get into though into much detail there. So, but all of that, I know that's a, that's, that's, that's a lot of sort of abstract stuff that I've thrown at you, but I, I sort of go into a lot of that, especially some of the work of Bohr, to get us to the point of, of knowing that, that electrons have, have, have this arrangement around a nucleus. But not only that, and this is where a lot of that quantum work comes in. Everything that we do talk about with electrons, we're going to talk about them in terms of like definite locations and so forth. The reality is much more weird than that. The reality is that, is that they're governed by probabilities and this quantum behavior. And so even though we're going to talk about electrons in sort of definite terms, the, the, the reality of them is that these definite terms are all just probabilities. And so anytime that I say, we're gonna find an electron here, what I really mean is we have the highest probability of finding an electron here. Could be somewhere else. You can think of it sort of like a spinning fan blade. We know that at any point, the, the, the blade is somewhere within this region, but we can't necessarily point to exactly where. Similar with electrons. So we can define these regions where we would expect to find them, but we can't necessarily pinpoint the location exactly. Whew. Okay. So this now leads us to talking about what we call quantum numbers. Quantum numbers, allow us to start kind of giving an address to electrons and start thinking about where they are actually located. The first quantum number we're gonna talk about is quantum number N. I know that's a letter. What we're going to do is assign numbers to these. N, let's just go to my next slide because I know that shows it quite nicely. N refers to what Bohr shell is, is a term that we use a lot. What Bohr shell are we on? So here's our nucleus, and like Bohr found, whoa, 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 
So like Bohr found, electrons are found in certain shells, certain orbits around the nucleus. N just refers to which one are we actually on. Are we on our first shell? Are we on our second shell? Are we on our third, fourth, fifth, and so on? Each shell can only hold a certain number of electrons. And so we can calculate that. And so we, we refer to the shells as N, back up to that. And so for instance, N equals one, we're talking about our first four shell. Good God, Professor Staples, here we go. N equals two, our second Bohr shell, and equals three, our third Bohr shell, and so forth. Each shell can hold a total of two n squared electrons. And so our first Bohr shell, two times one squared equals two, can hold a maximum of two electrons. Our second Bohr shell can hold a maximum of eight electrons. Our third Bohr shell can hold a maximum of 18 electrons, and so forth. I use a, an address analogy a lot when I'm talking about quantum numbers. You can think of quantum numbers as, or you can think of N as sort of overall, generally, what town does a person live in? And so we're starting to get just a little bit of information about where we can find them. It turns out, though, that within the Bohr shells, there are actually sublevels as well. There are subshells. And we're going to talk about quantum number L. This is a lowercase L, by the way. So think of that as a lowercase L. And so every Bohr shell has subshells contained within it. These subshells are named S, P, D, and F. And so if L is equal to zero, that means that we're talking about what we call an S type of sublevel. If L is equal to one, that's a P type sublevel. L is equal to two, that's a D type sublevel. And if L is equal to three, that's an F type sublevel. And so all we're doing here, so again, we've got our Bohr shell. Within the Bohr shell, we have subshells or sublevels. Those sublevels are, are given different names, S, P, D, and F. So a different L value simply means that we're talking about a different sublevel. Now, if you're not confused yet, you're about to be. Not all sublevels exist on all Bohr shells. And this starts to give us an idea of that. And so the number of sublevels that can exist on each shell is equal to n. In other words, for n equals 1 for our first Bohr shell, there can only be one sublevel. And that's what we see here. So here's our first Bohr shell. There's only one sublevel in the first Bohr shell that's just an S type of sublevel. Our second Bohr shell right here can have two sublevels. And that's what we see. The second Bohr shell splits into an S sublevel and a P sublevel. Our third Bohr shell can split into three sublevels, S, P, very touchy mouse today, S, P, and D. Don't worry about this weird little overlap here. We'll talk more about that in the next lecture. But the third Bohr shell can split into three sublevels, so it has the S, P, and D sublevels. And the fourth Bohr shell can split into four, S, P, D, and F. And so not all sublevels exist on all Bohr shells. You will never find a D sublevel on the second Bohr shell. You'll never find a P sublevel on the first Bohr shell. You'll never find an F sublevel on the third Bohr shell and so forth. And so the order that I have the sublevels in here sort of is, is an order of energy as well. And so you'll always find an S sublevel on every Bohr shell. 
P sublevels are only found on the second Bohr shell and on out. D sublevels are only found on the third Bohr shell and out and so forth. Now this is important for us because each type of sublevel holds a different number of electrons. Now there's a reason I'm talking in pairs here, which will make more sense as we go on, but an S sublevel can hold one pair of electrons. And so our S sublevel here can hold two electrons total. A P sublevel can hold three pair of electrons for six electrons total. D sublevels can hold five pair for 10 electrons. F sublevels can hold seven pair for a total of 14 electrons. And so each sublevel can hold this different number of electrons. <sighs> okay, so just back up to here for a second, sort of look at it where we're at. So our first quantum number N tells us what sublevel, or sorry, what Bohr shell are we actually found on? L then splits us up into sublevels. And this starts to really give us a good depiction of what's going on there. And so our N equals one, our first Bohr shell, all we find in our first Bohr shell is an S sublevel. S sublevel holds two electrons. Now remember 2n squared, our total number of electrons on a Bohr shell. For the first Bohr shell, we can only fit two electrons, and that makes sense. The only sublevel found in Bohr shell one is an S, which holds two electrons. Bohr level, Bohr shell two can hold a total of eight electrons. Sublevel, or sorry, Bohr shell two has two sublevels now, has an S sublevel and a P sublevel. Two electrons in the S sublevel, six electrons in the P. <coughs> These are maximum amounts, the maximum number of electrons that could be held. And so those eight electrons that could potentially be in the second Bohr shell, two of them in the S sublevel and six of them in the P. Our third Bohr shell can hold a total of 18 electrons. The third Bohr shell has an S sublevel, which holds two, a P sublevel, which can hold six, and now also the D sublevel, which can hold 10. And there's our total of 18. And then finally, the F sublevel, where we can now add in another 14 electrons here in our fourth Bohr shell. So a total of 32 in the fourth Bohr shell. 2 in S, 6 in P, 10 in D, 14 in F. Come back to this slide if you're ever, and you will, as you're studying the stuff, as you're studying quantum numbers, as we're looking at electron arrangements, you're going to get confused in your head as to what's going on. I like this slide here a lot because I think that the, the slide really grounds you and brings you back to, okay, this is what's happening. This is, this is how many electrons can fit in each shell. And this is sort of what's going on there. Okay, this would be a good place to pause if you want, because I'm gonna go on and we're gonna talk about some other stuff for probably another 15 minutes or so, but this would be an, an excellent place to pause if you need a, a, a breather and I don't blame you if you do. And we're back. And so it turns out that each different orbital has a different shape as well. Yeah, we're messing with you even more. And so, S sublevels are the spherical shape. P sublevels, of which there are three, which we'll go into in just a little bit, have this dumbbell shape. D sublevels, there are four that have this sort of weird dumbbell shape and one that's this sort of weird dumbbell with a donut around it. You do need to know the general Fs. We're not gonna worry about the Fs start to get crazy and weird and we're not gonna worry about those, but you do need to know these general shapes of the S, P and D orbitals. And so let's sort of, again, back up and see where we're at with things. And so we have our principal quantum number N, which defines our 
um, sorry, defines what Bohr shell we're on. We have our quantum number L, which tells us what type of, of, of sublevel that we're in, an SP or a D. We also have quantum number M. So let's look at the, the maximum or the allowable values of each of these, because that'll help us clue into what quantum number M is all about. And so quantum number N, so again, that's our principal quantum number. And so equates to, for instance, what Bohr shell are we on? If we look at the allowable numbers for that, that can be anything, it's, it's, it's so integer values, theoretically up to infinity. Uh, for, for the realistic purposes, we, don't, we haven't found any atoms in their ground state that have electrons any further than n equals seven. But if we keep, if we find more and more and more atoms, if we discover more and more and more elements, then that could theoretically go up. L equates to our sublevels. The, what we call the allowable numbers of L go from zero to N minus one. Now, what that really means is like we talked about earlier that every Bohr shell only has certain numbers of, or certain types of sublevels in it. And so if we're talking about N equals one, then the only sublevels, the, the, the only values that L could be, so zero up through one minus one. So the only value that L could be has to be zero and that's it, which corresponds to an S sublevel, which like we said, the only sublevel in the first Bohr shell is the S sublevel. If N equals two, so our second Bohr shell, L is anything from zero up through two minus one, which means that now L could be zero for the S sublevel, or it could be one for the P sublevel. So Bohr shell two could have an S or a P sublevel and so forth. For N equals three, L, anything from zero to three minus one, and so L could be zero for our S sublevel, one for our P sublevel, or now two for our D sublevel. And then we could go through the same analysis for N equals four to show us that now we could have the F sublevel involved as well. And so that's what the allowable number of zero to N minus one really means for us. That for N equals one, the only possible Bohr shell is, the only possible sublevel is S with an L equal to zero. Bohr shell two, L could be equal to zero for an S sublevel or one for a P sublevel. Bohr shell three, L could be equal to zero, one, or two, corresponding to our S, P, and D sublevels. Now for Bohr, for, for quantum number M, M is, is sometimes called the, the magnetic quantum number, often also called the orientation in space number. The allowable numbers for M is that M could be anything from negative L up to positive L. The numbers here don't really matter that much. What matters for M, actually, let me bring this back to here. So let's say, for instance, that we're talking about an S sublevel. For an S sublevel, we talked about M equals zero. And so for an S sublevel, that means that M can only equal zero as well. The important thing about that is that is there's only one value that M could possibly be. For an S sublevel, M can only be zero. That tells us that there's only one, what we call S orbital. An orbital is the space occupied by two electrons. 
And that's very important for us. So one orbital is the space where two electrons can live. So in an S sublevel, there's only one orbital. Two electrons can live there. In a P sublevel, so now L is equal to one, M can be anything from negative L to positive L. And so M could be equal to negative one, zero, or positive one. Again, those numbers themselves aren't important. What is important is to recognize that there are three of those numbers which correspond to three different orbitals. And so a P sublevel is actually separated out into three different orbitals. Two electrons will reside in each of those orbitals. Remember P sublevels, and that makes sense because P sublevels hold a total of six electrons, three pair. Each of those pair are found in one of three different orbitals and so forth. A D sublevel where L equals two, that means that M could equal plus two, plus one, zero, minus one, or minus two, which correspond to five different orbitals. And here's our one, two, three, four, five different orbitals. And so that's quantum number M as it starts to give us information about the actual orbital where an electron will be. And so let's just sort of look at, at what we're, where that's going or where, we, where we've gone. So N, our principal quantum number, what Borschel are we on? What town do we li actually live in? From N, we go down to L, which, are, which is sublevels that exist within the Bohr shell. So now it would be like, what street do we live on? From L, we now go down to M, which gives us information about the various orbitals that exist within the sublevel. That would be equivalent to maybe what actual house are you in? And so we go from looking at what town are we in to what street are we on to what actual house are we in? And that's a lot of what we've actually just talked about. Sorry, I'm just gonna skip through a lot of this because I've already actually talked about it. And we've looked at those. Okay, so the last quantum number is quantum number S. Actually, we'll, we'll just come back to this slide here. Quantum number S is the spin of an electron. And so within the orbital, so the electron, we now have the orbital where two electrons will be. Those two electrons are spinning. And within that orbital, those two electrons will spin opposite each other. They'll spin in opposite directions. And so spin we depict as either plus a half or minus a half. Again, the number doesn't mean much, but it just means that we're spinning in opposite directions. So that's our last quantum number where we start to maybe get information about the actual person within the house. Getting a little creepy maybe. Yeah, and that's a lot of stuff that we're not going to get into here. Okay. This has been a lot, and I know it's a lot. And so let's just go back and, and sort of look at where we've been at in this lecture. We started out looking at sort of the, the nature of light itself and, and looking at waves and the properties of waves. Because where that led us to is the work of Niels Bohr, who was able to use a lot of that work with waves 
to figure out that electrons were actually located on specific orbits around a nucleus. The work of a lot of other scientists went into this too, and a lot of work with, with probabilities and with very complicated equations to eventually lead us to a brand new science. This is back in like the about 100 years or so ago, brand new science known as quantum mechanics, which then led us to be, being able to look at really this, this behavior of electrons and quantum numbers which start to tell us really infor um, sort of detailed information about the arrangement of electrons around the nucleus. And so we have these sort of three levels of arrangement. We have our principal quantum number. What basic Bohr shell are we on around the nucleus? From the principal quantum number, we then, all the Bohr shells are broken down into various sublevels, S, P, D, and F. Within those sublevels, electrons actually reside in orbitals. And that's described by quantum number m. Within those orbitals, the actual two electrons per orbital have spins, which we denote being opposite each other with either a plus a half or a minus a half. So that's the general overall breakdown. I do not expect you to completely understand this just from watching the lecture. And so, go back and read through the book again, watch a Khan Academy video or two. There's some great conversations on Brightspace with talking about some other resources and Khan Academy's come up a number of times. It's a great other resource to use, but this is, is very abstract and confusing stuff. It's going to take a while for it to sink in and for you to really understand it. So take a while with it, take some time with it. Go back and look at some other resources. Uh, but that is all that I have for today. And it's been a long lecture. And so take a well-deserved break. And we'll come back next time and look at how we're going to really start, start to use this in order to really look at, at um, some details in particular atoms of how electrons are arranged. So that's it for today. And I do hope everybody has a great day.